Well, if I could uh, have everyone's attention, please, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, everyone here to Wentworth Institute of Technology for this uh, lecture we're going to have, Rediscovering uh, Queen Hedda Ferry's Falcon Chair. Uh, just as a way of introduction, I just want to say a few words. Uh, my name is Jody Gordon, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences here at Wentworth. Uh, I'm also an archaeologist who teaches ancient world civilizations, which always includes a unit on ancient Egypt, as well as a visit to the Egyptian collections at the MFA across the road. And so on behalf of Wentworth and the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, I'd really like to welcome everyone to campus today for this very exciting lecture by David Hopkins, who you'll hear a little bit about uh, more in a minute. And I'd especially like to welcome the representatives and members of the American Research Center in Egypt, New England chapter to campus. Um, I was quite excited when local RC president, Nick Picardo, contacted me to gauge our interest in hosting a lecture, and especially one aimed at using design and technology. Uh, to reinterpret the ancient world. Thus, we at Wentworth uh, hope this, this won't be the last time that we can host such an interdisciplinary lecture on campus, since such interdisciplinarity uh, is part of the Wentworth modus operandi. But before I hand the podium over to uh, the President Nick, I'd like to quickly thank a few members of the WIT community who helped to make this event possible. Uh, Ronald Bernier and Aaron Kingston from Humanities and Social Sciences, Joanna Pearson and Josh Larson, who's helping us out here um, from Technology Services, Claudio Santiago from Physical Plant, Greg Abazorius from Communications, and Business Services for the use of the multi-purpose room tonight. Um, I'd also like to say um, for some of the students we have here today, if you're from one of the MCCS classes and you want to sign in with me, I'll leave a sign-in sheet up to the right there for you at the end. And uh, with that, I'd really like to once again welcome you to Wentworth. We're really glad to be hosting this lecture, and I'd like to hand things over to Nick to introduce our speaker today, Dave Hopkins. Thanks, everyone, and especially Nick and Dave for, for being here. Thank you, Jody. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, as Jody mentioned, my name is Nick Picardo. Uh, I'm the president of the New England chapter of the American Research Center in Egypt, or for short, ARCE, usually pronounced RC. Uh, RC, New England, and the uh, Wentworth Department of Humanities and Social Sciences are co-sponsoring this event this evening. Uh, it's one that uh, I hope will be the first of many, uh, particularly when uh, the RC chapter is able to identify uh, interesting speakers and projects that align very closely, as in tonight, uh, tonight's talk, with the, uh, the various missions and curricula present here at Wentworth. Uh, I'd like to also thank Jody especially and all of the other Wentworth staff and officials who helped him here on the ground in putting together the arrangements for tonight. Uh, just to give you a sense of what the American Research Center is, is uh, research center in Egypt is, um, it's broadly speaking a nonprofit organization that was founded back in 1948 to support research on Egyptian history and culture. Uh, also to foster a broader uh, knowledge of Egypt amongst the public, the American public in particular, and to strengthen American-Egyptian cultural ties. Um, practically speaking, what that has translated into over the decades is that uh, RC supports just about all American uh, research in one way or another that happens in Egypt, um, which nowadays has an, a stress primarily on archaeology, research, and conservation work. Uh, RC also holds the largest Egyptological conference in North America and publishes the primary uh, American journal on the field. Uh, on a smaller scale, regional chapters like RC New England are focused much more locally as kind of the public faces of the larger national organization that work, operates out of uh, San Antonio, Texas and Cairo, Egypt. Uh, chapters tend to organize events especially focused on lectures to bring some of the latest and most interesting things going on in the field to interested, the interested public uh, of any level of experience uh, in their home regions. Which brings, which brings me, sorry Dave, I just advanced your slides. <laughs> which brings me to tonight's speaker. Uh, David Hopkins uh, is a fellow colleague of the Giza Archives Project, excuse me, the Giza Project uh, at Harvard across the river. Uh, he was a student at RISD through 2006 and then went on to 
uh, obtained a Bachelor of Science in Media Arts and Animation at the New England Institute of Art in 2010. Uh, Dave, as you'll see, is no stranger to digital reconstruction of archaeological material. Uh, he worked for a company known as Public VR from 2009 through 2011, during which he worked on archaeological reconstructions of the site of Pompeii, uh, and also worked on uh, what was called the Egyptian Oracle Project, which involved a uh, major reconstruction or major modeling of an ancient Egyptian temple. Thereafter, he worked at, in 2012 for One Planet as art director on the Machu Picchu educational game. And since then, until now, from 2011 onward, he has been the principal 3D artist uh, for the Giza Project at Harvard. During which, as you'll see in his talk today, uh, his activities have included stepping away from the computer uh, and into the realm of reconstruction, fabrication, and archaeological interpretation. Uh, his experiences from which he will now uh, be sharing with you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nick, for that lovely introduction. Well, it was going to be a little surprise, the uh, unveiling of the chair, but it's, it seems to be exposed. <laughs> well, tonight I'd like to talk to you about the building process of Queen Hedda Paris's uh, falcon chair. Now, uh, this is the uh, last of Queen Hedda Paris's furniture to be reconstructed. Uh, Queen Hedda Paris's uh, furniture uh, was originally discovered in 1925 by George Andrew Reisner at the site of the Great Pyramids. This is an old kingdom uh, burial uh, shaft, and in it were um, it w everything in the tomb shaft was heavily uh, deteriorated. Um, pieces of gold lying on the floor, all the wood of the furniture had rotted away. Um, so it, it, w it was a it was a mess, and it was as if you took. Uh, several boxes of 5,000 piece puzzles and scattered them along the floor and, and grabbed a, a small group of people and said, have at it. <laughs> and this process took them um, uh, 18 months of working on their bellies at the bottom of a 90-foot shaft in about 110 degree heat with the bugs and the flies and um, uh, not a particularly wonderful work environment. Um, but the... What, the, what they did down there in terms of their note-taking, their photographs, their, they took thousands of photographs, they picked up every single piece inch by inch and recorded everything, gave it a number put, and put it aside in a group, and it, it, their record-keeping was far ahead of their time, and they were truly trailblazers, and it was with their efforts and their data um, uh, record-keeping that even allows us to do any of the reconstruction work, uh, not only um, uh, uh, reproduction of this particular chair, but anything at all. Uh, so I can't stress uh, enough the importance of proper uh, data uh, recording. So uh, this is our uh, reproduction of Queen Hedda Paris's Falcon Chair. It has uh, over uh, 2,000 pieces. And it is made up of modern uh, materials. Let's see here. And it's built from modern materials that mimic that of the original. Uh, it's made of cedar wood, uh, Egyptian inlay paste, which is better known as faience inlay, a material that is halfway between glass and ceramic. It has an effervescence process that gives you that bright blue color you're seeing in the back here. Um, it's also made with uh, thin sheet gold and, and uh, with a high copper content and about 200 feet of hemp cordage for the uh, base. So where, how did this thing start? How did we get to this, this spot here? Well, it all be, uh, began about four and a half years ago um, when I joined the uh, Giza Project at Harvard, and uh, we had uh, our, our goals, one of, one of many, was to build a reconstruction of what the Giza pl Plateau would have looked like four and a half thousand years ago, during the time of the fourth and sixth dynasty, uh, right after the completion of the building of the Great Pyramids by Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare. One of the tombs that was constructed was that of the tomb of Queen Hedda Paris and the contents within. We replaced all the contents from the actual tomb back into its original uh, uh, positions in the tomb.
So I'm going to talk to you uh, uh, a little bit about 3D modeling in general. When you're building a 3D model, um, you're building it for a specific purpose. And for this particular purpose, this 3D model was built for a web development as well as a runtime environment. So as um, my time in the game industry, um, uh, you learn to optimize your geometry. And so our first original model was a very low polygon count model. And all the actual rich data and detail in the model is doing it with 2D texture maps. Um, you bake down the textures and you bake in your lighting and you, um, it's for performance issues. But this is not something you can take and go rebuild or print or fabricate uh, with any digital um, manufacturing tools. But it was something um, that we had interest in doing. And it was a colleague of mine, uh, Russ Gant, uh, whose photo, for some strange reason, is not in my slide. It was earlier. Um, he uh, came up with the idea of, well, why don't we 3D print this thing? And I said, well, because we can't. <laughs> uh, there's not enough geometrical data in this model uh, to build it. But I think it's a great idea. I think we should do this, so let's, let's, let's do it. And so I spent the next uh, several months building up what turned out to be many um, 3D models from scratch, uh, working with the, our, our plans and section drawings, uh, all of the notes and photography that we had by the original excavators, really the deep data that they collected, and the write-ups that they did thereafter um, to build our first high-poly model. Um, and then our next high poly model, once we learn something new, rip it apart, build another one. Uh, how, is this really right? And asking ourselves constant questions. So uh, when building it piece by piece, well, how, what kind of mortise and tendon work? And how do these joins, are, how are they constructed? Uh, using um, uh, History of uh, Giesig Necropolis, Volume 2, George Andrew Reisner, uh, he's got several notes in there as to how they might have done the joinery work, the Morrison tendon work, as well as um, their um, clever, some really cool clever ideas that they had. So right in there, uh, right in the middle here, you can see there's a little spot that with some dotted lines that says leather. So one really interesting uh, technique that they used was actually use drilling a hole through it with uh, some wet leather cordage, knotting it on either end. And as the leather dried, it tightened and for, uh, formed a bond between uh, each of the pieces that you were connecting. And then you would pat, you'd fill that gap, and uh, once you gilded it in gold, you had no idea that that was even in there. But it was... A, a, a brilliant technique to, uh, especially with the types of adhesives that they had, to strengthen the bonds uh, of the um, uh, woodworking uh, pieces that they built. We again used the photographs and their notes, um, their detailed notes telling us what size each piece was. We had horrible photography. Um, some really high resolution photography as it was being picked up, it was scanned at beautiful high resolution. You can zoom right in. You can see all the detail in each piece. Um, the problems with it, it's black and white. We had very few color photography. And um, the later photography, the, such as these images you see up here now, were taken later um, at lower resolution um, when they began the assembly process and started really trying to figure out uh, which pieces went to which object, which there were several of. There were two chairs uh, down there, uh, chair A and chair B, the falcon chair, a carrying chair, um, a box with beautiful uh, inlaid bracelets, a uh, curtain box with, again, covered in gold and faience inlays and stone inlays. Um, and you have to figure out which piece based on where it's found, trying to synthesize uh, how each piece would have collapsed on each other and figure out, you know, uh, what puzzle uh, are you trying to work on? Uh, and so with, the, with, with what we had, um, uh, it had a lot of uh, blind spots and lead us, uh, led us to and force us, honestly, to go comb through every single photograph about a thousand times. And it was, it was honestly a ton of labor and research time. But it, that it, it, we did get to our first uh, high-poly 3D model, 
and we were pretty satisfied with it. And so it was time to go and try to 3D print this thing. So we took a journey over to MIT uh, where we uh, hooked up with a friend of ours, Neil Gershenfeld, who he runs the Bits and Atoms Lab at MIT. He's also the founder of the Fab Lab. Uh, and he has um, uh, one of the, he's definitely on the cutting edge of uh, uh, digital uh, manufacturing tools. And um, he's had some great insight. And it was there we actually made our first 3D prints. Um, gonna, so 3D printing, uh, I'm sure many of you in this particular audience are very uh, familiar with it, uh, has really um, expanded. And you could really do a lot more these days with 3D printing than you could in the past. You can um, do it on huge scales um, and with a variety of materials. In this particular case, this is a resin uh, 3D uh, print. We could have, we did a, another one in plastic and we could also use metal. You can print now in circuit boards. You can print organic material and editable uh, material. Um, and there's really no limits to it. But you, we wanted to take our data set to the next level and not build it out of synthetic material and not build it in one go. Because we've already learned a ton through the modeling process. And if we hit print and had it had a machine build this, we wouldn't learn anything from the process. So we wanted to build a chair out of original materials, or as close as we could get to original materials. It's really hard these days to import wood out of Lebanon. Um, so <laughs> we used Spanish cedar instead. <laughs> um, and we didn't... Uh, and synthesizing the right kind of gold compounds uh, for the sheet gold also um, really hard to do without ancient Egyptian blacksmiths. So we mimicked <laughs> the original materials as best we could uh, to try to run into the same problems that they would have. And it was at MIT that uh, Neil introduced us to a representative of a company called ShopBot. Uh, ShopBot is, makes uh, CNC milling machines, and uh, the gentleman uh, uh, actually lent us a machine for the duration of the project. So uh, it was a small 24-inch uh, bed, uh, three-axis ShopBot. They do make multiple-axis ShopBots that allow you to carve on multiple axes. Five axes may mean with a, a rotating head, so you can carve around corners. Uh, we weren't as lucky, and honestly, we really didn't have the space for it because um, we we borrowed the attic temporarily from uh, uh, one of, one of the researchers in the basement of the Semitic Museum, and we said, "Oh, look, we're going to take your space for maybe four months." This four months ended up turning into a year and several months, and he was particularly upset with us. But we were like, "We gotta finish," um, so have an accurate idea of how much time a project is going to take before you uh, begin down that road because <laughs> it can be quite uh, um, eye-opening. Um, so we got our... our, our in, so in terms of uh, more about our milling machine here, so limited on size, uh, 24 inches actually was just enough to fit most of our pieces of chair um, individual piece of the chair on it. And since it's a three-axis milling machine, it only allows you to work on one part at a time. So this forces you to come up with creative techniques. Um, I'll skip this slide for a second. To match your cuts from side to side to side, especially if you're using a, something with extreme compound curves or something that has really organic shapes to it. So one technique you can use in your 3D cutting if you have to do something that is like a, a really organic leg or body part that you're milling out of wood um, or plaster or wax or whatever you choose to use uh, is actually extend your model or use the negative space in your model to put geometrical patterns so that when your drill head is is uh, pressed into the wood um, at a shallow depth, you can, mar you can see where uh, each side is lining up because you have to manually uh, realign each cut uh, every single time you start the machine. And occasionally the machine uh, can make mistakes and has little hiccups and will cause the program to stall. And you need these markers to uh, reset your cuts. So um, is, I can't stress that enough because you will make mistakes. Um, and 
And these cuts um, come in multiple paths. So uh, your first cut, as a top image here, is a rough cut, uh, which you use a large um, drill bit with higher feeds and speeds to remove the um, uh, large bulk of the material to really cut down on your fine uh, uh, milling time. And your second cut, in this particular case, uh, we used a 1 16th inch drill bit um, to do much finer detail. And you can go smaller than that, but you, you, you really have to m manage what you're doing so that um, you're really, it's about managing your feeds and speeds so that um, you don't ruin your drill bits. Smaller than 1 16th drill bits get really fragile. So if your feed speed is too high, meaning the rate in which the, the drill head is moving, uh, you can break and damage your drill bits. Uh, if your feed speeds are too low, uh, the friction from the drill head um, and the uh, sawdust that you're creating um, around your uh, cut material can ignite and you can start a fire. Uh, so these materials um, and machines can be quite hazardous um, and need to be uh, manned at all times. If they need to be manned at all times and the average cut time on one side of each of these things, including our rough cut and finish cut, is about 8 to 10 hours. So if each side takes 8 to 10 hours and you need to be there on site to prevent accidents from happening, this is an extremely time-intensive process. Um, and so you really need to plan out your work accordingly and make sure you have other things you can be working on in conjunction with each of your cuts. Luckily, um, there was plenty of work to do. <laughs> um, these machines are great, and they only take you part of the way. They still leave detail, uh, detailing work left to be done with other tools, and this does not uh, fully escape from the use of, say, ha classic hammer and chisel techniques to carve out your mortise and tenons, or using 18th century uh, wood planes to carve and uh, do your uh, complicated curves on the uh, seat itself, as well as um, using more high-tech technology that the, uh, obviously the Egyptians didn't have a Dremel tool uh, with multiple different types of uh, uh, drill bit heads to uh, do detailing work. I felt blessed to have that. <laughs> So here we can see uh, laid out on the table, um, we have our mortise and tenons for the seat base. Once those tenons are slid into, the, in, into their uh, uh, sockets, they will be uh, drilled through and then wood pegs will be slid through the holes, uh, locking them in place uh, with physical wood locks, not using adhesives for, for this. Uh, no adhesives is actually necessary for those if you're, using, if you're pegging your pieces. The same is done with the uh, legs themselves, and uh, the leather ties will secure your mortise and tendons for the upper arm uh, and uh, your bottom, uh, your the bottom arm and the vertical support. The falcon will actually, uh, with its single mortise and tendon, and each of the wing tips and top of the head of the falcon actually touching each of the surface surfaces, it'll actually lock itself in place. Um, each of the pieces laid out on the table here, nice view. And finally, our first dry fit wood construction. I can't tell you how happy we were <laughs> to finally see this thing uh, uh, taking shape. It, it, it was months of labor to get to this point, and let's see here. Um, we, we had our, our huge concerns. The seat base looked like it was too big. The arms looked like they weren't the right proportions. And we had no way of gauging it until we finally put the pieces together. And we couldn't pieces, put the pieces together uh, because um, uh, the extra wood on either side for the mortise and tendons that still needed to be cut. So even if we did put them on top, it would it's still disproportional and gives you a, uh, a, a, a really incorrect image as to what it's going to look like. Um, so when we finally had our tenons uh, and Morrison tenons cut, we were able to slot each tenon and slide these things together and get this thing seated uh, for some photography. Uh, and we were over the moon. Uh, and we were like, we can do this. We, we're, like, we're like halfway there. And we were not. <laughs> 
because the next stages would prove, despite how time intensive this was and la uh, hand labor intensive with all the sanding ne needed to be done on this and detailing work, uh, the nightmare would soon reveal itself. Um, and we're not yet at the nightmare, but the, the gilding process was time intensive, but not nearly as bad as what's to come. <laughs> um, so uh, we did use sheet gold uh, instead of... Uh, uh, the previous reconstructions were actually done with a different gilding technique. So you have your water gilding, oil gilding, uh, you know, using um, uh, uh, gold leafing. And the specular highlights and the reflections that you get whilst using that technique really didn't, um, wasn't good enough for us. It was practical and easy to do. Uh, it picks up a lot of the wood resolution. So using the techniques of, you know, leaf gilding with super fine gold, um, it's great to pick up the, re the, the wood detail, but it doesn't give you that real feel of gold, the, the, the actual reflections in it. And this was very important to us um, to try to mimic what the original was, seeing how we had photos of the original sheet gold why not try to do it how they did and, again, run into the same problems that they did? So before we even tried to dare touch the uh, expensive gold order uh, that we had, um, we did it several times in tinfoil uh, of a close to the same thickness, and we were able to be a little more reckless in it. So we did all our burnishing with our, uh, with our stone agates. Uh, we, did, we cut out every single piece uh, meticulously with razor blades, um, and this allowed us to test the patterns and where are we going to hide the seams and forcing us yet to ask more questions. Um, not all of the gold that we had in terms of photography was in the greatest conditions and a lot of it had rips and tears and so it had to unravel yet again another mystery of uh, especially when it came to things like the legs which were particularly difficult how do you hide the crinkles and the creases that are going to occur when you're wrapping um, a 2D material around a very complicated compound curve and 3D object. You're gonna need several slices, cuts, and tears. So how do you limit that and still have a, a respectable looking leg without looking like paper mache in the end? So uh, it took several uh, tries to come up with a pattern that would actually work for that. And of our next step was figuring out, okay, well, we have our patterns, and now we need to figure out how we're actually going to attach this. We initially wanted to use an animal hide glue, which would have likely been what they would have used in ancient times, and we tried several. We tried a hide glue, we tried a fish uh, glue, another animal type of glue, a uh, synthetic glue, and finally a, uh, a synth synthetic polymer uh, glue that... Um, in the end, uh, was the one we uh, we went with. With a we were doing a pull test to see uh, how easily it was removable, uh, putting it in different environments, and um, uh, seeing which one would last longest. Uh, and it turned out to be uh, Jade 403, um, which is uh, commonly used by conservators uh, around the world for its stability and it uh, its other useful properties. And it's still um, it. Um, its flexibility too, so it's not super, it never dries out completely, it's not super rigid, it don't, won't crack, it, it's really long lasting. A lot of people actually use it for repairing uh, book bindings and things like that. Um, but it, it held, gr held the uh, gold better than any other piece and we almost couldn't even remove the gold once it was actually fully adhered. Um, so it was a wonderful option. So one discovery that we made in this process was actually that of the woven seat. Uh, the original reconstructions that were done in Cairo and the MFA had a solid wooden seat. Um, unfortunately, they're not on display uh, today. Uh, they, they used to be, it's in the, it's actually right next to the room behind the Egyptian exhibit. There's another room where they, keep, where they store, store all their stuff that's not on display. So it's so close, but you can't see it. <laughs> um, but, and so we are like, well, our, our previous model had a solid seat, but uh, I get, so we, what we did was we, we had an intern for us and we said, I want you to find every single possible example of ancient Egyptian furniture you can possibly find, go. <laughs> as well as, um, and so 
and whilst we were doing our gilding, he was uh, finding all our examples, and we looked through every single one of them. A lot of stools had um, wooden, uh, solid wooden seats uh, in, in panels. Um, not a lot of the chairs had wooden seats. They seemed to have woven seats the majority of the time. And furthermore, they, they seemed to have the same type of weave, um, which is called a twill weave. Uh, a twill weave is unlike a, a really basic weave, which goes over, under, over, under. A twill weave uh, goes over, under X amount of times, um, skipping very, uh, very uh, varying numbers of strands to make certain uh, geometrical patterns that give you a sense of motion and also create the illusion of arrows. Uh, this is a pattern that is used everywhere today and uh, is as old as time, apparently. Um, you can see it in bricklaying patterns as you're walking down the street, and you, won't even no you wouldn't even notice, but after this talk, you'll say, that's a twill weave. <laughs> um, so looking at the back of the chair, too, uh, the image on the left with the two uh, neath symbols running down either side, we can see that we have uh, horizontal uh, arrows uh, giving us that motion back and forth. And uh, though it's not made up of, um, of, uh, of, of weaving material, it could be very much so interpreted and is identical to a twill weave pattern. So with this, um, all the other chairs not having, a, uh, having woven seats and not having solid seats, and then the last clue was those two symbols. Those two symbols there, um, on top of the flag stand, uh, we have a, uh, two beetles with two crossed arrows, and that is for the goddess Neith. And she is not uh, among many things. She's the uh, protector of queens, which is very interesting. She's the goddess of war, and she's also the goddess of weaving. Okay, so we have a symbol, uh, the symbolism on the back for the goddess of weaving, uh, surrounded by a pattern which looks remarkably like a specific type of weave pattern. Uh, all our other examples of Egyptian chairs have woven seats, and they all seem to also mimic that same exact pattern. So we felt extremely confident that, yes, it was a woven seat. So now we got to figure out how to make it. <laughs> and now comes the biggest and uh, worst nightmare uh, of it all. So fans. Fans is a wonderful material. Um, like I said earlier, it, is a mix, it is, reacts like, it, uh, like glass meaning on a hardness scale, is that of a seven. Uh, it is extremely difficult to cut, and cut without fracturing in places where you do not want it to fracture. Um, and it can be sanded from the sides, um, but it's, it's extremely resistant to it. Uh, I found that um, I could sand with a uh, belt sander about five pieces before I had to replace the belt. Um, so it's... It, so we had to figure out, okay, this, is, this material is horrible to work with. How do we work with it? And that is where our wonderful Kathy King comes into play. Kathy King is the Director of Education of the Harvard Ceramics Program in the uh, Office of the Arts at Harvard University, and she is an expert on Egyptian paste. Um, well, at least she certainly is now. She she was uh, she was extremely knowledgeable about it, but she has now done more fans work than I could say anybody in the modern world, <laughs> um, with the amount of uh, tiles that she produced uh, for for us thousands of tiles. So first, we were trying to uh, uh, figure out our chemical mixtures. Uh, fans is really interesting. Um, it gets its color uh, from the effervescence process. Um, you see a microscope cross-section uh, here. As the, uh, the metals effervesce to the surface uh, along with the uh, silica content, giving you that uh, bright blue, uh, in case of our copper content, uh, color, and creates a glass coating on top. But it can range heavily in color. If you change the percentages of your material even slightly, it will throw your colors off into crazy directions. Commonly, uh, light blues, uh, dark blues uh, can achieve greens, as you can see in the top, and also um, even into black and very, very dark uh, blues associated with that. 
So how do we make our fans with limiting how much handwork we actually had to do on it? So we go back to our wonderful tabletop shop bot milling machine. If we take our the same data that we use for the pocketing of our cuts and we reuse that to cut the inverse on plaster, we can then fill those voids with their Egyptian paste while it's still malleable and bake that same material. Now the plaster, once the moisture in the plaster is removed, um, it actually becomes extremely brittle and can break under your fingertips and crumble. Um, so that was a really great technique. We did use um, do some terracotta tests as well to see how the ancient Egyptians would have likely have done it. And we did replicate uh, what we believe would have been the uh, technique that they would have used if they were to uh, replicate and cast from the wood using terracotta molds, uh, uh, materials that they had on hand. But for our time-sensitive deadline, which was rapidly approaching, um, seeing how we were several months over our ex anticipated deadline, we needed to speed up our process. So we used the machine once again to carve out these pockets into large sheets of plaster, had them baked, and uh, they were ready to go into each of the holes. Unfortunately, what we didn't take into account was the extra addition of the gold that now pressed into the side walls of the gold uh, of the each of the pockets, and this caused a, uh, a one one hundredth of an inch of a dis difference, which was enough to make it so that we actually had to do a lot of handwork. And luckily, not as much um, to reduce the size of it, but still a sizable amount of handwork to fit each of the pieces in there. We actually. Uh, uh, saving grace uh, in this was uh, taking a trip over to Tags in Porter Square where I was desperately looking for a tool to cut each of these pieces, which we, we made into strips so that we could cut each of the strips to the correct sizes that we would need, especially in the tight corners um, where we needed to make really small triangles. And there was no way to make a mold out of the uh, for these ahead of time because it's organic and each piece is going to be custom to the spot that it's sitting in. So we really needed to cut, uh, uh, a tool to cut them. And actually, what, what I found was a tile crimper in the hardware section, and it was amazing. It made my day. So we were actually, we tested a couple of things. We tested a bolt cutter. We tested metal scissors, and, um, and we found this tile crimper, and it it, it, I was so over the moon. <laughs> I can't express how happy I was uh, to find that. And um, we spent um, uh, the last week of, of the year uh, from, we didn't take a Christmas break. Uh, my colleague uh, Russ Gant and I, um, on crunch time, we took one day off for Christmas and we spent every single day after that, weekends included, um, and grinding to finish this 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 project and uh, oh. <laughs> um, I'm missing an image I can pull it up but luckily we we finally we finally actually completed the project I'm actually going to go all the way back up to the top to give you a lasting image um, I had an image uh, of us standing behind the chair uh, Kathy King Russ Gant and I um, but for some strange reason it's didn't make it so, uh, time for questions, I suppose. <laughs>